Welcome again, saints. I am your dearest servant and lesson host, uh, Brother Pastor Brian Dell from St. Mark Baptist Church right here in Waterloo, Iowa. Before I go any further, I'm going to ask you to go down and subscribe to this channel. We are pushing up on 4,000 Sunday school students per week, and we want you to be a part of that. And not only subscribe, we want you to hit the notification bell as well so you can get updated content. And today is lesson four, again, June 25th, 2023, unit one, the prophets proclaim God's power, a fresh start. The devotional reading today is 2 Corinthians 5, 12 through 21. And the background scripture is Zephaniah 3, 14 through 20. The print passage is Zephaniah 3, 14 through 20. With respect to, and I haven't done this before, but with respect to the unit, unit one, the prophets proclaim God's power. I want to just spend a few minutes with you there explaining something very doctrinal to you. We know that in Ephesians chapter four, respect to the church, the Bible says he gives some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. And then we have to bring our brother uh, deacons in as well from the book of Acts, as well as first Timothy chapter three. Deacons aren't necessarily called directly by the Lord like that because the Bible says, look out among you. And they give that to the congregation, congregational leadership to be able to call those folks. But as I told you, God's the work of God's hands and he's building uh, and sanctifying. It is always going to come uh, with that six or six days of creation. Humankind failed. Jesus was on the cross six hours to correct the pollution of the six days. We could go on from there. The office of prophet is still necessary. And if you remember in Israel, in the Old Testament, when they got into trouble, God would call prophets. And some of them became, later on, it was judges, but it then went back during the Babylonian captivity to prophets. And the reason is simple. We all have gifting. And even Ephesians chapter four, when it lists those giftings, it says it's to edify the body of Christ. So with respect to prophets, they, now I'm not talking about TV prophets. I'm talking about the real ones that God actually calls, the ones that end up hated, the ones that end up preaching his word are viewed as troublemakers oftentimes. So when we talk about that, pastors obviously are local shepherds, but the prophets proclaim God's power. That is perfect to do. But who does a prophet, if they aren't necessarily sitting in local congregations, they're not called to necessarily. They got to have fellowship, though. Just like John the Baptist, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they were, I won't call them lone wolves, but there's something that all of them, even going down to John the Baptist, had in common, and that is they spoke God's power to world powers. Throughout the Old Testament and even into the New Testament, you see prophets speaking truth to world leaders. You see prophets speaking truth to the kings of Israel. Even New Testament, one, John the Baptist was killed because he spoke truth to Herod. He spoke truth to power. Why is that important for today's lesson? Well, the unit says the prophets proclaim God's power. Saints, we all have something that we need to do, that we all have some gift and knowledge, wisdom, and it's not just limited to those five offices plus deacons. There's people that have knowledge, miracles, of the gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues, etc. Things have gotten out of whack with respect to our international church leadership because now we have like church pastors like sit next to presidents, etc., And that is not God's model. God's model is these lone wolf prophets go to uh, world leaders, prime ministers, kings, these people, and proclaim God's power while shepherds are local. So when we talk about prophets, I want you to do a study, Sunday school students, before I move on, about what it is to be a prophet because they are few, but they do still exist today. And throughout the Bible, all of them had one thing in common is that they spoke truth to world leaders, kings, presidents, prime ministers, even into today, presidents and prime ministers. Pastors aren't necessarily equipped to do that. They are. They have that heart of grace. I got a brother, uh, Pastor Dr. Marshandis Robinson. <laughs> I use two words with him, relentless grace. He just has that. Prophets are more of in your face, bloodletting, those sorts of things. Not saying that they can have a tender heart as well because Jeremiah did. Amen. So I just wanted to frame that for you. The key verse today, Zephaniah 3, 17, 8, B, it says, the Lord thy God is in the midst of thee, is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over you uh, with joy. And it said later says, uh, he will rejoice over you singing. So at, with our new format here, I'm going to just, we're going to read some scriptures, but I'm just, it's got 15 minutes or less with you. I want to give you some big ideas so you can get on to your church service, wherever in the world that you are. The lesson aims to say, examine God's proclamation through Zephaniah that God will deliver the faithful remnant. Now, when we talk about 
God's proclamation through Zephaniah. Remember, the Bible is this organism. When the New Testament talks about the body being jointly and neatly fit together, eyes, ears, this, that is exactly what the word of God is. So it wasn't just Zephaniah proclaiming this end times saving of the faithful remnant. It was Isaiah. Don't believe me? Read Isaiah's chapters 50 through 66. You are going to see the coming Messiah. In 53, who has believed our report? To whom is the Lord of the arm revealed? You move on into that. That Messiah is going to come to God's people. Is going to They're going to be renewed. But also others are going to be invited in. And that is us, former Gentiles. And that. And then you need to also read Ezekiel. Chapter 37, package that, Isaiah 50 through 66, and Revelation uh, 19, 20, 21, 22. And you're going to get this huge picture that God will deliver the faithful remnant. He's going to deliver us. Now, that was written to Israel. We get that. But please remember this, that we are wild olives grafted into the natural branch. God was not plain when he told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, get you out from your kindred, from your country to a land that I will show you. I will bless them to bless you and curse them to curse you. Here's what I want you to hear. But through you, the whole world will be blessed. Didn't just say Israel. It said the whole world. Was that fulfilled, Brother Dale? Yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The world, only begotten son. Remember the whoso might clause that I talked to you about. Next on lesson names, and then we'll move down to read some verses. Believe that God will defeat oppressors and deliver his people from their suffering. God's going to defeat oppressors. But here's what I want to warn all of us on today. You better make sure that you turn and repent if you are one of those oppressors. Because a lot of times, we, we all see it in the house of God in order to complete ministry activities, people step out, uh, uh, church leadership committees. Sometimes we step outside of God's will and we start pressing against people's free will, trying to twist their arm, put them in places they do not, are not gifted. So when we talk about defeat and oppressors, we have to remember that God is just. Any form of oppression needs to be repented of. Any form of autocratic church leadership needs to be repented of. God never told us uh, to violate people's free will. He didn't do it. So who are we to do it? We can't be greater than our master. This is what the Bible said. Maintain hope and suffering and communicate hope to a new generation. That's just it, saints. Wherever God has you at, you have to maintain hope and suffering because the Bible says if we suffer with him, we will reign with him. And remember, Jesus also told his disciples, marvel not that the world hates you because it hated me before it hated you. A servant, the Bible says, cannot be greater than his master. So in, inside of your suffering, please, by the mercies of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, still look to the hills from which cometh your help. Because I read somewhere that all my help comes from the Lord. And not only that, some of you are suffering because and you are struggling in your faith because you've been praying for God to deliver you from suffering. And he hasn't yet. Y'all know I've told y'all before and I'm going to tell you again. Our prayer needs to be that old song. Lord, don't remove the mountain, but give me the strength to climb. That song blesses my soul. Because it acknowledges that, Lord, I don't want you to remove it. Or, Lord, even if you was going to remove it, uh, I, it's not now. But give me the strength to climb. I know it seems simple and cliche, but I'm telling you this. Maintain hope and suffering. You have to stay with it no matter what. Because I can tell you, none of our sufferings could have been worse than Jesus hanging up on that cross. And communicate hope to a new generation. Now, I was having a conversation with somebody. And... One of the things that, you know, came up was how do we communicate the gospel message to a new generation? Here's my caution to him. Here's my caution to all of us. We just need to live and be repentant and be who God has called us to be. But the way I communicate hope to a new generation is by ministering to people that are younger than I am. Understanding that it is they that's going to speak to their generation. We get it twisted sometimes. We sit in places so long that we become stale. We sit instead of raising up a new group of leaders. I told you somebody said something powerful to me. One of, one of those voices crying in the wilderness. They came and got my face. Uh, saints, and it was powerful what they said to me. They said this, Dale, you're trying to for reform a corrupt priesthood. Why don't you do what Jesus did and raise up a new one? They just came out and said that to me. So the way we communicate hope to a new generation is by listening, being discipled. But are we pouring into 
uh, people of the next generation. Now, here's what many people say. Well, we ain't got a lot of young people in our, uh, we ain't got a lot of young people in our congregation. Well, you come in contact with young folks somewhere. How about pouring into them wherever you are? Since when do people have to come into the house of God in order for us to pour into them? Matter of fact, I wouldn't have even made it to the house of God if somebody wouldn't have poured into me before they brought me to the house of God. Remember, saints, we talked about spiritual CPR. Ooh, I'm on a roll again. Uh, analysis of the biblical text renewed by God. This is Zephaniah 3, 14 through 17. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He has cast out your enemies. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of you. You shall not see evil anymore. That had to be the end of the end of time. In that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, fear not, and to Zion, let not your hands be slack. The Lord your God is in the midst of you and is mighty. <laughs> he will save. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over you with singing. <laughs> He didn't only create us in his own image and after his own life. When we fell, he redeemed us through the blood of Jesus, sent his own son to redeem us, to ransom however we want to frame that. We know with the prophet Elijah, he cooked for the prophet Elijah. And now I find out not only did he do all of that, those things, he's singing about me too. Come on, man. I heard old song say, what kind of love is that? <laughs> He cooking, he feeding, he creating, he's singing. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm having one of those sweetest honey moments that I have every once in a while. God told a couple of the prophets, he said, fold the scroll. And he said, put it in your mouth. And the prophet said he put it in his mouth, that word in his mouth. And in his mouth, it was as sweet as honey. If y'all know what those old scrolls were made of, <laughs> the parchment, <laughs> and they taste like honey, how you only God could do something like that. What do you think? Have you ever imagined the Lord's rejoicing over you because of his love? How does this imagery help shape your concept of God? When I was growing up, you get, I used to get in the principal's office and the principal, you know, you, you get to SWAT and then he put you on the phone, put me on the phone with my mama. And she'd be like, I'm waiting on, I'm waiting on you. <laughs> Got something for you. So mama was waiting for I get home to do that. Like she was really hostile. And the reality is God does get angry. His overriding attribute, I told you his information. We could talk about that some other time. But his overriding attribute for our purposes is love. It has to be. The Bible says for he to come to God should come to him because God uh, should love because God is love. It didn't say God knows how to love. It said he is Remember, even with Jesus in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He said, Jesus know the word. He said, he is the word. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. Thing didn't say he know. I am. That becomes important here because when I think about his overriding attribute being love, I know it is because if it wasn't, we should all be dead. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Found in Christ Jesus, we should be dead. I know you think you're awesome, but through his strength, we are renowned for God. And then we'll finish up here. I will gather them at the sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of you to whom them it was reproach or burden. Behold, at that time, I will deal with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. This is a huge deal. I will. He's going to give his people honor in every land. Now, he's specifically talking about Israel here. Every land where they have suffered. Because remember, because of their sin, God threw them out and said, you guys are going to be a hissing. Everywhere they go, they're a hissing. God says he's going to shift that here. And everywhere they go, they're going, people are going to be like, oh, God's people right there. That is eternally changing right there. That I don't want you to miss that. They were cursed because they sinned and were made a hissing and God's going to fix that hissing and turn it into celebrating them. Ah. Saints of God, as we close today, I just want us to remember uh, some just some great, just this, this big idea. Saints, as we do need a fresh start, God's going to give his people a fresh start, but we have to be obedient to what he says. So be it. We'll see you next week. Subscribe if you stuck with me this long. Amen.